Hello everyone, this is Sarah from Hamilton. In today's video, I continue our discussion of Gavin Ortland's critique of the creation and veneration of icons. In this video, I seek to develop further my initial argument from the Bible for the creation and veneration of icons. In doing so, I look at particular examples from the biblical text where symbols of God are created in response to his self-disclosure. I seek to elucidate why the symbols take the particular form that they do, and importantly, I seek to de demonstrate from Scripture that the proper response, once these symbols have been created, is to venerate them with liturgical honors. We look forward to continuing this discussion, and we hope that we can engage Dr. Ortland more directly in the future. If you are interested in pursuing these subjects further and in answering Protestantism respectfully and from the Bible, consider signing up for my 17-hour lecture set, Answering Protestantism from the Bible, which I will send to you in a Dropbox once you've signed up. You can also sign up for the sequel set, Six and a Half Hours, Answering Calvinism from the Bible, or Answering Judaism's Rejection of Jesus, which you can find at seraphimhamilton.com a 15-hour and counting expanding set of lectures working through the Old Testament and demonstrating that Jesus is the unifying principle of the whole. This set can be listened to with appreciation and largely agreement by people of all Nicene Christian confessions. If you're interested in my ongoing thoughts on scripture and biblical theology, consider becoming a subscriber to my Substack. I post six days a week, and three of those six are available for everyone, while the other three are available to paid Substack subscribers and also patrons. Regardless, thank you so much for watching this video, and please keep myself and Michael Garten in your prayers as we pursue this and other projects. We look forward to hearing your thoughts. So we began this series by talking about the way in which Biblical theology relates to the argument of St. John of Damascus. And what I want to do today is I want to expand on that discussion by looking at some specific biblical instances where people uh, seem to offer veneration to created objects. And I want to go further than simply noting that they offer veneration for created objects. I want to actually look at the underlying logic of why it is that they offer this kind of veneration in the particular context that they do. And then we can look at the way in which that relates to New Testament texts about the Incarnation to see if that provides a legitimate basis for the creation and veneration of icons in the Christian era. And in doing so, I want to interact implicitly with some of Dr. Ortland's comments where he specifies his problem with the orthodox veneration of icons as specifically pertaining to kinds of liturgical honors, or he often says, as windows to heaven. So I want to look a little bit at what this actually entails, what the biblical theology of imagery is really about, and then by implication, whether that can be related to the idea of icons as a window to heaven. So in order to do this, we want to re uh, recap what idolatry is in a biblical sense, because it's clear that biblically speaking, idolatry is broader than the mere act of offering something to a statue. Uh, Paul, for example, in Ephesians chapter 4 says that covetousness is idolatry. Why would Paul say that covetousness is idolatry? In some sense, all sin is idolatry. And the reason this is the case relates to the biblical theology of mortality, immortality, and the way that that ultimately relates to God himself. Romans 1 provides one of the classic biblical expositions of the nature of idolatry. And it says about mankind in sin that seeking to be wise, they became fools. A reference back to Genesis chapter 3, where Eve saw that the tree was good to make one wise. She took the tree and became mortal. And in seeking to be wise and acquiring folly instead, man exchanged the glory of the immortal God for images resembling that which is mortal. So we have the basic biblical principle here that you become like that which you worship. So if you direct your energy towards that which does not have life in itself, which does not have life in virtue of what it is, but derives it from God, well, then naturally you are going to be mortal. The only way that creatures can continue to exist is if they are constantly sustained from the outside, that is, from God himself. And if creatures direct their ultimate attention towards that which is created and is not God himself, and if they make that their ultimate good, then ultimately they acquire nothing at all. In seeking to have anything without God, you get neither God nor the thing itself, because the thing itself, in fact, points to God. 
Now, the other use of image in the epistle to the Romans is in Romans 8, 29 to 30, where mankind in the church is predestined to be conformed to the image of the Son. And I think Paul uses a very important phrase in what, fo what follows, which then opens us out into the broader biblical and particularly the Old Testament discussion of what constitutes idolatry. <clears throat> Paul says, uh, and those whom he foreknew, he also predestined to be conformed to the image of his son. And those whom he predestined, he also called. Those whom he called, he also justified. Those whom he justified, he also glorified. And in the word glorified, you can see the connection between this reference to image and the reference to image at the beginning of the epistle. Because at the beginning of the epistle, it was the worshiping of images which were mortal, which led to the forfeiture of divine glory, that which gives immortality. And here it is the worship to Christ, which conforms one to his image, and thus the acquisition of divine glory and immortality thereby. But I want to focus in on this word called, because the word called <clears throat> can also be rendered as named. And in fact, when we see the word called or the word named, we have to keep in mind that usually both concepts are in some way in view. How is it that we can acquire genuine knowledge of God? It is only by calling on the name of the Lord. And the only way we can call on the name of the Lord is if God has called our name. Thus, in the book of Revelation, Jesus says that he will give to the one who conquers his own new name. We are named with a new name, that is the name of the only begotten Son of God, the name of the one who has been named from all eternity, and we enter into the relation which he has with the Father. And as that relation is from all eternity and is immortal, we are brought into immortality by conformance to his image and likeness as well. And in the concept of naming and calling, we have the biblical theology of idolatry in miniature. And by focusing in on cases in scripture where people are said to call upon the name of the Lord, be given certain names, or worship things according to certain names, we will get a better sense of what the Bible is talking about when it speaks about idolatry and the relationship that that does and doesn't have to the orthodox and traditional Christian veneration of iconography. So let's look at the contrast between Genesis chapters 11 and 12. Genesis chapters 11 and 12 are filmed with language of naming. Genesis chapter 11, we have not only the story of the Tower of Babel, but we have a genealogy. That genealogy is headed by a person named Shem, and the word Shem simply means name. But in Genesis chapter 11, the story in the, of the Tower and the city of Babylon, or Babel, what mankind is seeking is to make a great name for themselves. That is, the ultimate source of their existence, as a name is meant to express who and what you are, the source of their existence is self-referential. It is something they seek to build by themselves. Come, let us build a city and a tower with its top in the heavens. Here, the origin of their activity clearly begins on earth. They mean to reach and stretch themselves unto heaven, thereby building for themselves a kind of eternal legacy and immortality. That is, after all, what name means, even in a colloquial sense. We make a great name for ourselves, and thus we endure in the legacy of future generations. It is the quest for a kind of immortality without God, but an immortality which can only ultimately truly be acquired with reference to God. Thus, the tower in the city of Babel is an uh, extended intensification of the crime of Adam and Eve, who sought to live life on their own terms acting with the life that God had given them to do things that God had forbidden them from doing. Ultimately, as all projects uh, invariably do, they come to nothing. Mankind cannot build a name for themselves, for there is no other name which ultimately can be named but the name that God speaks in Christ. And in Genesis chapter 12, we see the reality of which the tower and city of Babel was a parody. In Genesis chapter 12, Abram does not intend to build a great name for himself. Rather, God says to him, I will make your name great. Whereas the builders of the tower and city of Babel, Babylon, sought to build a legacy for themselves, which would endure for eternity. Here, God says that he will build Abram that legacy. God ultimately will give Abram a new name, and God will make all the families of the earth be blessed in him so that Abraham's descendants will endure to and beyond the end of the world. And I want you to notice what Abraham does after God makes this promise. 
After Abram comes into the land and God has promised to make him a new name, give him an eternal legacy and an eternal inheritance, Abraham calls upon the name of God. If you read Genesis chapter 12, verses 7 and 8, you find that God first appears to Abraham, then Abram builds an altar, and Abram calls upon the name of the Lord. It is only after God discloses himself that Abram can speak back to God. This dynamic, which plays out in large form in God's relation with mankind, we can see in miniature form in the relationship of all parents to their children. Your children will not speak unless they are spoken to. We can only speak God's language when he first speaks it to us. Any attempt to create some kind of self-referential language will end only in Babel. Literally, it will mean nothing at all. The builders of the tower and city of Babel meant for their city to be uh, to mean gate of God, which is the literal meaning of Babylon or Babylon. But the author is implying it is really God who gave them their name. The real meaning of the name they sought to build for themselves is nonsense, Babel, confusion. But here we see the true name, which is spoken by the one who had received the hearing of God's name. Moreover, we are told that when Abram builds an altar, it is with Bethel on the west. And this is an exceptionally important note. The scripture never uses phrases without intention or meaning. And in, we're, in telling us that Bethel is to the west, a city which actually doesn't acquire that name until much later in history, we are being invited to consider the meaning of the story in view of what is to follow. And the story which this anticipates is the story of Jacob at Luz Bethel. The city's name is first Luz. Jacob gives it a new name, Bethel. Bethel means house of God. And what's fascinating about this is that this text refers even more directly to the story of the tower and city of Babel or Babylon. And that in the story of the tower and city of Babel, uh, the builders mean to build a uh, tower with its top in the heavens. The same phrase is used here in Genesis chapter 28. Here, Jacob goes to sleep and he sees a ladder with its top in the heavens. And we are told that God stood beside that ladder. I think the natural meaning, as I've discussed before, uh, is that God is standing at the bottom of it near Jacob. In other words, while the builders of the Tower of Babel sought to build their way up to heaven, here God has built a ladder down from heaven and thus communicated himself to Jacob. And whereas the builders of the Tower of Babel sought to unite mankind on their terms, here God promises to give Jacob an everlasting seed which will spread to the four corners of the earth, north, south, east, and west. This is the true city of God of which Babel was the parody. And what I especially want the viewer to notice here is what Jacob does. After God gives uh, reveals himself to Jacob. After God builds the reality of which Babel was a parody, disclosing his own name to Jacob, it is in fact Jacob which gives the old city of Luz a new name. Once God speaks his name to Jacob, Jacob now has the divine power of giving things new names. And what is that name? That name is Bethel. Jacob looks at the city, which is called by the Canaanites, Luz, and he says, no, this is really Beth El, the house of God. And the intention of God from the beginning of the world was to make the world his dwelling place, which is why the Bible ends with the city of God descending from heaven to her earth, suffused with his own divine glory. When God descends to meet us, he grants us the power of speaking his speech so as to make the world his dwelling. And the way the New Testament uses this specific passage is filled with important implications. It is in John's Gospel, with its special emphasis on the theology of the divine logos, indwelling human creation, that explicitly alludes to this passage from Genesis. Jesus speaks of himself as the one on whom angels are ascending and descending, a phrase taken right out of this passage from Genesis chapter 28. In other words, it is Jesus who is the reality signified by the ladder to heaven. Jesus is the one who carries the world up to God and carries God down to the world, thus enfolding this world into the life of God. And it is Jesus whose name we speak out into the world. How is it that we make the world a dwelling place for God in Christ? It is by speaking out and Christizing the world by the power of the Holy Spirit. It is by transfiguring the world after the image and likeness of Christ. 
And in a future slide, I'm going to draw out the connection between the iconographic depiction of the likeness of Christ and the particular form, that, the particular way that Jacob responds to God's self-disclosure in the ladder from heaven. We also see that this is not just an incidental connection extending to one passage of the book of Genesis. John's gospel, in fact, richly alludes to this whole theme of the divine name. God speaks his word out into the world. He speaks the logos into the world, the word by which God discloses himself from all eternity, now embeds himself in the life of the world, so that Jesus can say, I have manifested thy name to those you, you have given me. Moreover, there are two sets of seven I am sayings. There are seven I am sayings, and there are seven I am the sayings, beginning with I am the bread of life, ending with I am the true vine. In other words, Jesus is the one in whom God has disclosed himself fully and totally. And this gives us the capacity to respond in and through Jesus Christ, mirroring the form of the self-disclosure which God has given us in the person of Christ. So let's look at the theme of the name in Deuteronomy chapter 12. As I've talked about before, Deuteronomy uh, gives us another form of the Ten Commandments called the Ten Words in the Bible. And then Moses will thematically proceed through the Ten Commandments in order, expanding on the implications of each commandment as he proceeds through. Deuteronomy chapter 12 begins the second word section of the book of Deuteronomy. In other words, everything which is described here relates in one way or another to the theology of the second commandment, which I remind you is the commandment which is most at issue here. It is the commandment to neither make nor worship a false image. And the reality here is that idolatry is man's declaration of independence from God. It is the expression of that Babelic impulse to speak your own reality into existence without reference to God, to have some kind of reality which is not communicated to you from God, which ultimately is impossible, which is why any attempt to name such a name is the naming of nothing at all and the becoming of nothing at all. Deuteronomy 12, 2 to 3 says that the purpose of the conquest is in large part the cleansing of the land from the names of these false gods. Deuteronomy 12, 2 to 3 says this, you shall surely destroy all the places where the nations whom you shall dispossess served their gods on the high mountains and on the hills and under every green tree. You shall tear down their altars and dash in pieces their pillars and burn their asherim with fire. You shall chop down the carved images of their gods and destroy their name out of that place. It is the land of Israel, which God establishes as his home base, from which he will extend his work to the nations. One reason why Jesus says it is so important the gospel begins from Jerusalem. That is where his base of operations begins. Israel destroys the names of the false gods out from Canaan, but God does not destroy except to build something better. And so Deuteronomy 12.11 says this, that the place that the Lord your God will choose to make his name dwell there, there you shall bring all that I command you, your burnt offerings and your sacrifices, your tithes, the contribution that you present, and all your finest vow or votive offerings that you vow to the Lord. Now this is an important point to make. What does it mean to say that the name of the Lord dwells in the sanctuary, in the place which the Lord shall choose? The first thing I want to call your attention to is the significance of the choice of God. If you read through the book of Deuteronomy, you will find that its major theme, perhaps the governing theme, is the sovereignty of God in choosing to disclose himself to and through the people he, he chooses for his own good purpose. He chooses Israel to be his own nation. They shall choose one from among their brothers, and they shall worship him at the place which he chooses. Here the point is not so much the specific place, which actually changes throughout Israel's history, but rather the fact that God chooses it. You worship God on God's terms because in worshiping God, you are responding to the call he issues. If you worship God in a way which is not responsive to the call he issues, who are you really worshiping? Worship is this kind of call and response dialogue. So what goes on here at the place which the Lord shall choose? They bring their burnt offerings, their sacrifices, the contribution, and all your finest vow offerings that you vow to the Lord. Well, what is a votive offering? This is, in a sense, the supreme expression of the conversational or call and response nature of worship. 
God has disclosed and manifested his name to Israel. He has placed his name here. And on account of that, this is where you call upon that name. This is where you engage in covenant and conversation with God. Later in the Bible, when Solomon consecrates the temple, we are told that when Israel is in trouble, they are turned to turn towards this place and call God in reference to this place. This is the place through which you will engage in the relationship which God has taken Israel to have with himself. It is because it is the place which the Lord will choose, the place where you will interact with him. And the reason that God's name will dwell in Israel is because God has promised Abraham a great name. Why is it that it is God who gives Abraham the land of Canaan, which he cannot buy from Philistines or anyone else? He waits for God to give it to him. It is because, as Melchizedek says in the chapter before God makes that promise in Genesis chapter 15, it is God who is the begetter or the possessor of heaven and earth. God has the ultimate ownership rights over the world. He is the heir of the world. And thus for Abraham to ultimately become an heir of that which God owns, Abraham must receive the name which God will give him, which in the end is God's very own name, which he speaks into the world. And the only one with the authority to disclose the nature of that name is, of course, God himself. In order to respond, you must respond after you have been that is, I would argue, one of the great themes of biblical theology, the priority of divine calling, and the subordination of human response to that call, which then uh, the response then mirrors out the nature of that call. One other point I want to make in relation to Deuteronomy 12 is that this illustrates what I've called the covenantal contingency of the application of the second word. We see in Deuteronomy, not only here, but also elsewhere in the book of Deuteronomy, that forms of worship which were practiced by the patriarchs are actually prohibited here. And what this suggests to us is that the nature of our obedience to the second word and the implications of the second word very much depend on the kinds of things which God has uh, prohibited and commanded. He does not do so arbitrarily, but because he is bringing the world somewhere and because he is altering the world in view of the place which he ultimately intends to bring it to, the way in which we respond to God changes depending on the way he is speaking to us. In former times, Paul tells us at the beginning of Hebrews, God spoke to us by the prophets, but now he has spoken to us in his son. We respond to God in liturgical worship in a new way because, in a sense, he has spoken to us in a new and greater and more exalted way. The temple and the sanctuary with its priesthood is a higher form of nearness to God than the old worship of the patriarchs. And Israel, in view of what God has done in covenanting with them at Sinai, must recognize that change in covenant history and now respond to him in a new way. Just as things which are prohibited to you when you are a child are okay when you're an adult, and certain things which are overlooked are okay when you are a child are prohibited as an adult, so also is this true of humankind and its relationship with, uh, with God corporately through time. So what does it mean to name? And I think this gets really close to the heart of the issue with Dr. Ortland's argument which after uh, some critique from us, he has, in our view, pulled back a little bit and restricted what is prohibited in the veneration of icons to very specific liturgical acts. And this is one reason that I've called your attention to the theme of naming uh, right here. Naming is a very formal ritual and liturgical act. It is the response in the great liturgical pattern of history to the call which constitutes the essence of human life. So Genesis chapter one, as is now widely acknowledged by pretty much all parties, is in large part the narrative of the creation of the world as a dwelling place for God. And he rests in that world on the Sabbath. And throughout Genesis chapter one, God is consistently speaking into the world, giving things names. And as you proceed through Genesis chapter one, we see the world is called into an increasing relationship of responsiveness to God's call. 
God simply speaks into the world in the early creation days, but then we find the earth is now responding to God. It itself is bringing forth fruit trees and grain plants. And then God speaks directly to his creatures, to the fish and the birds, and blesses them. And then God speaks to, and that word to is used in his creation of mankind. In other words, God speaks to man, not merely expecting obedience in the way that was true of the birds and the fish, but man now has the capacity to speak back to God, and that is why God says, let us create. Man is made as a conversational being who can speak out God's name because God himself is one who can say of his own life, let us. That is the essence of human life. So God's endowment of his own name to creatures in and through creation is his naming. And it has as its consequence our speaking that name back to God liturgically. So just look through Genesis and the prophets as some particularly acute examples. Abraham's altars. Abram builds altars and he calls on the name of the Lord. God makes a covenant with Abraham. God says, I'm going to have this new relationship with you. I'm going to say something new to you. As a consequence, Abraham can speak God's name back to God and say, act in accordance with those qualities which are disclosed in your name. It is after God makes himself known to Abraham and appears to Abraham, Abraham can build an altar and call on the name of the Lord. Jacob at Bethel, as we talked about in Genesis chapter 28, after God builds a ladder down to earth and makes himself known to Jacob, Jacob has the power of naming something the house of God, something which was formerly called Luz, but it is ultimately named Bethel. Moses in Exodus 32 to 34 is an especially pertinent example because it deals very directly with the theme of idolatry versus true worship. Israel worships God. They're trying to worship God through the golden calf, but God has not disclosed himself in and through a golden calf. Thus, they exchange the glory of God for the image of the golden calf. And that phrase is actually used in the Psalms about Israel's idolatry, and Paul is alluding to Israel's idolatry with the golden calf. What happens then is Moses ascends the mountain of God, and God says, I'll make my name known to you. And because God makes his name known to Moses, Moses can engage in this conversation with God and then descend to Israel radiant with the divine glory. It is because God speaks his name to Moses that Moses now bears the name of God in himself. And then especially Zechariah 14, which says that the name of the Lord is going to be engraved on even the most common of objects. That is, the divine presence is always going to flow outwards and it's going to flow from the top, that is from God, out from the holy city, suffused with his presence, which is what Zechariah 14 is about, and it flows to the ends of the earth so that it sanctifies and makes even common objects bearers of the divine presence. That same narrative is found in Isaiah uh, 65 to 66, where we find a river of life flowing out from the temple, sanctifying the nations, and then it circles back and they bring their gifts to God. Why can they bring their gifts to God? Because God has embedded himself in those gifts, and now they become modes of relating to God. Ezekiel 47 also it describes the river of life welling up in the Holy of Holies, going out, flowing to the Dead Sea. The Dead Sea is the lowest point in the world. The Messianic Temple is the highest point in the world. So Ephesians 4, he who ascended has also descended to the lower regions of the earth. If he has descended, then we who, and he who has descended is the one who carries us back up to heaven and he fills all things. So what is idolatry? Idolatry is a subversion of divine sovereignty. Because what it does is it makes the locus of activity and power the creature. The creature takes something and attempts to use it as an instrument of manipulation to do his own will in the world where the will of God is ultimately irrelevant. I think Michael in future discussions is going to bring out the importance of this and looking at Greco-Roman practices of idolatry and the importance of this concept and understanding the early Christian critique of pagan idols and the way in which that doesn't, doesn't relate to the Christian veneration of iconography. What idolatry does is it constitutes a thing or it attempts to constitute a thing as self-referential, where my individual will is ultimate and I can impose that will on something by some kind of magical means. I make something, I speak to it, I give it independent life, and now it does my will. God here is not even a player. 
ultimately that's ontologically impossible or our life comes from God and that ultimately will always be uh, self-destructive. Now, biblical worship, in contrast to idolatry, is always subsequent to divine self-disclosure. And as a consequence, it always mirrors the mode of that disclosure. This is why, even though Israel, I think, was trying to worship the God of Israel through the golden calf, it did not ultimately constitute true worship of God because it was subsequent to his disclosure, but it didn't really mirror the mode of that disclosure. They didn't worship God as God had revealed himself. And because we have no knowledge of God except insofar as he reveals himself, it was the worship of no God at all. And as you become like what you worship, they become like a calf which was stiff and kicked. Those who worship blind, deaf, and dumb idols become deaf, dumb, and blind, a major theme in biblical theology. So what's the theological upshot of this? It's that created things serve as a conduit of divine revelation or self-disclosure when God in his freedom communicates his presence and character along the thread of that created being. So when God discloses himself through a particular creature, he embeds his presence along the thread of that creature and we can follow that into God. I think that's what's going on in Exodus chapter 20. An altar of earth you shall make for me and sacrifice on it your burnt offerings and your peace offerings, your sheep and your oxen, in every place where I cause my name to be remembered, I will come to you and bless you. Here you see the priority of God's self-disclosure. It is where he reveals himself, where he causes his name to be remembered, that you can build an altar of earth. And then it says, if you make me an altar of stone, you shall not build it of hewn stones, for if you wield your tool on it, you profane it. Well, why does it say that? Why are cut stones prohibited in this passage from Exodus? Well, the reason is because if you're cutting stones, according to what pattern are you actually cutting it? You're putting something of yourself into the stones. And remember, this is prior to the revelation of the tabernacle. So the only reference which you can have is that creativity which comes out of your own mind. If you wield your tool on it, you profane it. If you make this referential to yourself, apart from God's self-disclosure, it doesn't serve as a genuine altar to God. In other words, it's a profane thing. It's a secular object, not something which is consecrated to the service of God. And you can compare this to Daniel chapter 2, where we read of a stone which is cut without hands, which breaks down the kingdoms of the earth and grows into a great mountain which fills all creation. That great mountain is, I think, is relatively uncontroversial, the church of God. Christ here is the uncut stone. He is the form of the Lord who gives us the pattern of true worship, which is to say true relation to God the Father. And it is Christ who joins himself to the stuff of our world and forms it after the exact pattern that God has given to us in him. As a consequence, the divine presence grows and suffuses the entirety of creation so that that mountain, which carries the divine presence from heaven to earth, fills the entire creation so that along the thread of every created being, we can shape that into a Christic image of God through which, in some sense, we relate to God. So what does that actually look like? The question which we face is what our reciprocal naming of God actually constitutes. So a few basic points here, which we've called, uh, uh, which we mentioned already, calling the name of the Lord is associated with sacrifice and liturgy. Compare Genesis 4, in uh, the days of Seth's son, man began to call on the name of the Lord. Well, the whole context here is about uh, true worship and false worship, Cain and Abel, both of which who offer competing sacrifices. Genesis chapter 12, very clear. This is a liturgical action. Abraham builds an altar, calls on the name of the Lord. This is the theology of the name and the altar invoked in Exodus chapter 20. And I want to mention some New Testament examples, which aren't on the slideshow as well, uh, which aren't on the slideshow. Acts chapter, I believe it's Acts chapter 22, where Ananias tells Paul in his baptism, why do you wait? Rise now and be baptized. Wash away your sins, calling on the name of the Lord. Why is this phrase calling on the name of the Lord used in the context of baptism? In our Eucharistic liturgy and orthodoxy, we use psalms that refer to calling on the name of the Lord in a liturgical context. And there are also biblical examples of this being used. 
Calling on the name of the Lord is our response to his call. He's disclosed the name of the Lord in the Lord Jesus Christ, and we respond to that by calling on him to fulfill the promises that he has made in Christ, because Jesus Christ is the same yesterday, today, and forever. A passage which I remind you occurs in the book of Hebrews, which is talking about the high priesthood of Christ, an altar from which those outside have no right to eat, so on and so forth. All of these things ultimately converge in a liturgical context. Look at the Ark of Genesis chapter 17 to 22, which all concerns the seed which is going to be born from Abraham who is circumcised. The organ of generation is circumcised and then that generates Isaac. And Isaac is ultimately offered to God as an ascension or a burnt offering in Genesis chapter 22. We see that subsequent to God's commandment to Abraham to circumcise this flesh, God stands under a tree in Genesis 18. Then the next reference to a tree that we have is in Genesis 21, where Abraham plants a tree and there calls on the name of the Lord, the everlasting God. Here we see the basic principle that the way in which God discloses himself is mirrored in our response. So let's get more specific than this. What does liturgical honor actually look like in relation to a creature? We can get more specific than this, and I've built all of this up so that when we get to it, we will see the true significance of Genesis chapter 28. Genesis 28 is not just one passage of scripture among many, it's not just an example I've plugged, plucked out of a grab basket. Genesis 28, as the inversion of Babel, as a text which alludes to and inverts the paradigmatic example of idolatry in scripture is the supreme example in the book of Genesis of what true worship ultimately looks like. So read, let's read the text, Genesis 28, 18 to 22, Jacob's pillar. Early in the morning, Jacob took the stone that he had put under his head and set it up for a pillar and poured oil on top of it. He called the name of that place Bethel, but the name of the city was Luz at the first. Then Jacob made a vow saying, if God will be with me, which God has just promised, he said, I will be with you and I'm going to make your seed spread to the four corners of the earth. If God will be with me and will keep me in this way that I go and will give me bread to eat and clothing to wear. I want to point out to the audience here, this is the reality which Adam and Eve were seeking. What were they seeking? Food and clothing. Here Jacob says, if God won't give me food to eat and clothing to wear so that I come again to my father's house in peace, then the Lord shall be my God and this stone which I have set up for a pillar shall be God's house. Just a bit of what I think is kind of interesting when uh, Paul in uh, uh, Timothy talks about the church as the pillar and ground of truth in the context of being the house of God. It seems likely to me he's referring back to this passage. Not directly relevant, I just think it's kind of cool. And all, and of all that you give me, I will give a full tenth to you. Now, this is really interesting for me because the reference to giving a tithe to God and the reference of, uh, in the context of liturgical honors to this pillar recalls for me uh, when uh, bread and wine is part of the story in the story of Melchizedek and Abram Bill brings a tithe to Melchizedek in Jerusalem. So why a pillar? Why does Jacob erect a pillar to God? The reason for this is because it mirrors out in visible form the mode of divine self-disclosure. God has built a ladder down from heaven in this place. As a consequence, Jacob can take a stone, erect it as a pillar, and utilize that as an instrument for true and genuine worship. It mirrors out the mode by which God has condescended, and he who condescends makes by that condescension the way for our ascension. So what is the function of this pillar in relation to creation? God manifests his name to Jacob. When God manifests his name to Jacob, he says, I will be with you. That is the divine presence is going to be with him. And then he says, I am gonna spread your seed to the four corners of the earth. So the name comes down through Jacob, then goes out. So Jacob now, because the name has been spoken to him, erects a pillar mirroring God's self-disclosure and then engraves this name into the world calling Luz Beth Elm, the house of God, pushing out the divine presence. What about uh, in relation to God? How does this pillar function? 
Well, God covenants with Jacob here. God condescends to him and speaks to him. And then this pillar becomes the way in which Jacob speaks back to God. Remember, the stone which Jacob erects as a pillar is the stone on which his head was sleeping. So if you think of that just visually, what's Jacob doing? He's erecting that on which his head was resting. This is actually the means for his own ascent liturgically back to God. In terms of the liturgical role this plays, I think we could go into more perhaps another time. This close relationship, this whole story actually um, plays in relation to the Day of Atonement. There's lots and lots of stuff which connects those two texts. In fact, the liturgical stuff in Leviticus often retells stories that were told in Genesis and Exodus. So liturgy is kind of a ritual form of the narratives in the Bible. All of this takes place in relation to the site of Bethel. Bethel is not just a random place. It is during part of the judges era, the site of the liturgical center of the world. So it is where the tabernacle seems to have been placed for a time. Judges 21 tells a story uh, which seems to be dischronologized. It seems to happen relatively early in the period of the judges. And uh, we are told that they went to Bethel to inquire of the Lord. And inquiring of the Lord, just think about what that means. This is the place where you are interacting with God. This is the ladder to heaven. This is the place where you call on the name of the Lord and engage him in conversation. Judges begins with the angel of the Lord, who is Christ himself, talking to Israel. And it comes to its conclusion with Israel going to Bethel, talking back to God. This is a liturgical image through and through. And if case you missed it, Jacob anoints this pillar. Is the pillar the ladder to heaven? No, it is not identical to, la to the ladder to heaven. Is the pillar the divine presence? No, it is not identical to the divine presence. But the pillar in the specific context in which we read it mirrors the form in which God has made himself available to the world. And Jacob righteously uh, replays that and intentionally constructs something as a mirror and a response to God's self-disclosure. And in doing so, he pays it liturgical honor, pouring holy oil on top of it. That holy oil represents the divine presence. It's not the divine presence. It represents the divine presence. Uh, James Jordan, I think very memorably, says oil is liquid light. Oil is what you put in your lamps. That's what represents God's own uncreated light and glory. God is pouring his presence down on Jacob in this vision, in this dream of the ladder to heaven. Jacob, as a consequence, takes the pillar. It is a sign of himself. It is a sign of his own humanity. He erects it to God as a sign of the ladder to heaven. He pours oil on it. This liturgical honor, which he pays to it, is the proper response to God's pouring of himself out on the world. And the reason this is Zion, not Babylon, true worship and not idolatry, is because Jacob's response is both subsequent to God's disclosure and it mirrors the form of God's self-disclosure. So this is an icon in a theological sense. If Jesus Christ is the icon of the Father, as the New Testament says explicitly is the case, and if Jesus Christ has truly disclosed himself to us in visible form as the icon of the Father, what by this logic is the proper response? The proper response is to mirror back that in a way which uh, follows the logic of the incarnation. The humaniformity of icons in the new covenant follows out from the self-evidently humaniform existence of our ladder to heaven, who is Jesus Christ, who carries God to us and us to God. And Jesus Christ is the ladder to heaven as the Gospel of John uh, puts it. The Gospel of John speaks of Christ as the one on whom angels are ascending and descending. And because Christ in his incarnate body, a visible body radiant with the glory of God, because that is the form in which God has manifest himself to us, how would we respond if we are to be truly children of Jacob? How are we to mirror the reality of that mode of self-disclosure? Well, if it is true that we see the glory of God in the face of Jesus Christ, then the natural response is to create an image of Christ which mirrors and replicates the reality of that image in the incarnate Christ. So finally, let's turn to the bronze serpent. 
So in the past, I have been quite cautious about invoking the bronze serpent as an example of liturgical honors. And the reason I've been cautious about doing it is because if one is going to do that, you need to be prepared to give a response to the obvious objection, which is that, okay, yes, the bronze serpent seems to have some liturgical role, and yet Hezekiah takes that very serpent and he breaks it down. So I think this is a really useful study of what constitutes the boundary between true worship and idolatry. And I have to credit Michael with a lot of the insights, which I'm going to hopefully share with you here. So Numbers 21 uh, describes a plague which comes on Israel after they complain, fiery serpents. Uh, actually, the word is seraphim, uh, seraphic serpents. So we have this association between angels and serpents going through the whole Bible. Uh, fiery serpents come and they bite Israel. And when Israel, Israelites want to be healed, what happens is Moses makes a serpent under God's commandment and he puts it on a pole. The Hebrew word is nes. And what I discovered in preparing today's discussion is that this is actually only one of three uses in the whole Pentateuch. And actually, it's not that typical a word. The next use in, uh, in the canon is in Isaiah 11, in a messianic prophecy, which I just think is so cool because it shows you Jesus in the New Testament. They weren't making things up when they connected this with the person of the Messiah. This is a connection the Bible itself uh, leads us to, to make. So the serpent is set on a pole. That's one of three uses in the Pentateuch. What's the first example? Well, the first example is in Exodus 17. After the defeat of Amalek, you'll remember that Moses has to lift his hands up to heaven, and Israel is actually to look to Moses uh, uh, when uh, they're fighting Amalek. And as long as Moses is lifting his hands to heaven, then Israel is prevailing. When his hands get tired, Israel begins to lose the battle. They ultimately win the battle. Moses builds an altar, and he calls the name the Lord is my banner. But the word banner is Nisi, which is just an inflected form of, uh, of Nis. Uh, this is the same word that is used in Numbers 21, 8. The Lord is my banner. And so when we see an example of a serpent being placed on a pole and Israel is to look to that serpent and live and overcome this plague, I think the implication here is that the serpent is a representation in some form of God. The serpent represents wisdom, and Jesus tells us to be as wise as serpents. This is the true serpent, the true God to whom you look and receive healing. Also note in Exodus chapter 15, uh, Israel, uh, God discloses his name as the Lord is my healer. I think there's a connection between that and this text as well, especially in view of the fact that that is said. Uh, when God heals bitter waters, and then in the same context, Exodus 17, God gives them water from a rock. Too much stuff to go into in detail here, but just some notes in case people want to pursue that further. I would note the importance of naming in this context. Moses builds an altar. An altar is a miniaturized holy mountain, something upon which you climb in your ascension to God. When you burn an offering on that, that smoke goes up to heaven and you have identified yourself with that offering. You are entering into God's presence in and through that offering. Moses calls it uh, the Lord is my banner. And then we find that name evoked in Numbers 21, 8, where the serpent is set on a pole. So. The whole idea here, if the, one of the names of God is the Lord is my healer, if God uses created things as a conduit for his own divine gifts, and if those can be licitly used as a conduit for his own divine gifts as they mirror God's own pattern of self-disclosure, that gives us the theological categories to understand why in Numbers 21 we have a kind of icon of God. We have an image which God commands Moses to make, and when Israel looks upon that image, Michael has uh, described one form of veneration as a reverential gaze, Israel is ultimately healed. And I'll note that the elevation of the serpent, which is lifted up and Israel wants to look on it, contrasts with the one other use of this word in the Pentateuch, Pentateuch and that's Numbers 26.10. Korah and his rebels rebel against Moses' authority. Korah is actually Moses' cousin, which is a really interesting thing, not directly relevant here, but I just saw that pointed out. It gives a kind of interesting psychological dimension to what's going on when he rebels against Moses' authority. Korah is Moses' cousin. His rebels go down into the earth. And what happens then? They become a banner. That's the same word. They become a banner or a sign which expresses God's devouring them in his presence. 
fiery judgment. That also, that theme is also evoked here in Numbers 26. So the serpent is lifted up, God's enemies go down. Some interesting connections present themselves here. Um, uh, fiery serpents bite Israel, it kills the Israelites whom they bite. If Israel wants healing, they have to look upon the true serpent, which is lifted up and elevated on the bronze pole. Fiery serpents are going to consume or bite Israel, just as the earth will later consume Korodath and Abiram and the rebels who follow them. Israel has to voluntarily give themselves to God, submit to his will by looking or gazing upon him expressed through this image, which he himself has commanded them to make. So why does Hezekiah then break it down? Does this constitute an irrevocable barrier to seeing this text as any kind of anticipation of Christian iconography? Or even worse, does this demonstrate uh, against our intention that iconography is at the end of the day idolatry because Hezekiah himself ends up breaking it down? Well, 2 Kings 18.4 tells us, Hezekiah removed the high places and he broke the pillars. He cut down the Asherah. He broke in pieces the bronze serpent that Moses had made, for until those days the people of Israel had made offerings to it. It was called Nehushtan. And I think the answer to this question lies in the fact that they give it an independent name. The purpose of these mirror instruments, which people create after God discloses his name to them, is to form a vessel and reference point by which the creation is seen to reveal and refer back to God. The pillar which Jacob creates is a sign and a means by which Jacob calls on the name of the Lord. Yet here we find that Israel has turned this image which represented and communicated divine power into an idol because they worship it according to its own name. This has ceased to be in practice a reference upward to God and now has become a self-referential idol. Instead of looking at it and thereby turning to God, calling on his name and realizing his promises expressed in the name, the Lord is your healer, they now call it by its own independent name. It was called Nehushtan. And that is why Hezekiah breaks it down. I think this example serves to be highly instructive as to the precise boundary point between legitimate iconography, legitimate description, legitimate disclosures of God and idolatry. Anything becomes an idol when it becomes disconnected from the genuine and glorified person of Jesus Christ who directs our mind to God the Father. Even the superficial name of Christ itself can become an idol. Uh, and when I say superficial name of Christ, I mean simply the sound Lord Jesus Christ. In early modern England, there are magical documents which ritually invoke the name Lord Jesus Christ for purposes such as helping a person gamble. Uh, you can find there are these little rhymes, Lord Jesus Christ, as I peruse. I remember that particular phrase from one of these early modern documents. Does that therefore mean that the invocation of the name Lord Jesus Christ is prohibited, is idolatrous? No. What it means is that our worship to God is, as St. Paul says, a rational act of worship. It is impossible to disconnect the significance of intention from that which is offered with one's body. Any attempt to say that this particular mode of veneration is simply prohibited without reference to intentionality is going to stall because the biblical theology of worship includes the body, but in including the body, it includes the mind as the governing principle of the body. And therein lies the distinction between legitimate iconography and idolatry. So why is it? In conclusion, that we can make images of God and Jesus Christ in the New Testament when we could not, in general, make such images under the Old Testament. It is because, just as 
the patriarchs could make pillars, which were then prohibited under the Sinaitic order. In the new covenant, God has disclosed himself in the person of Jesus Christ and has communicated that person to the ends of the earth. As Paul says in Ephesians, he has united all things in him. And thus we can do what Jacob did. Take the raw material of the world and shape it after the image as a mirror of the mode of God's disclosure in the incarnate Christ. And in so doing, because God has given us the capacity to symbolize him in Christ as God has disclosed himself in Christ, we actually realize the task of the church which is to Christize the world so that Christ is named in every place under heaven, so that Zechariah's prophecy is ultimately fulfilled, so that the name holy to the Lord will be engraved on every inch of this created order. That is the significance of iconography for biblical theology. Without iconography, it becomes impossible to both appreciate and to realize practically the goal and destiny of the church in glorifying the world after the likeness and in the image of Jesus Christ.